Superman is one of the most significant characters in the history of American comics, having set the template for what would be the dominant genre in the era of the comics code. This week, in a flashback to 2015, Kumar and I discuss the 1980s collection The Greatest Superman Stories Ever Told, as well as Alan Moore's Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. First, don't forget to take our listener survey to let us know what we're doing right or wrong as we put this show together and choose our topics. The link is in the show notes. This is Tim. And this is Kumar. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo with Kumar in Melbourne. Uh, this is the first time we've talked, the first time Kumar's been on the podcast since our uh, historic meeting in Tokyo <laughs> a few months ago uh, when we talked about uh, cr- the Crumb movie. Um, yeah, uh, and so after that, then the question was, okay, what are we going to talk about next? The opposite end of the spectrum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you, you suggested Superman comics. I'm like, okay, well, um, sure, why not? Um, so we, I guess the last time I recall talking about Superman on the podcast was when we were talking about Morrison's action comics at the beginning of New 52. It's been a few years ago. Oh, yeah, and we did All-Star, too. Which did we do first? Um, wow. Um, All-Star, I think that was longer ago. I don't remember... Exactly. But yeah, it seems like All-Star might have been first and then uh, Action Comics. Okay. Um, But uh, yeah, so why did you uh, suggest Superman this time? Well, much like All-Star, I ended up with two coffees for various (laughs) reasons. (laughs) And I'm like, "Eh, well, might as well um, send one of these off to Tim and we can talk about it. Um, yeah, the, so the, first the, he came out in 88. The, it was the greatest Superman stories ever told. Yeah. Yeah, so it was um, copyright 87 in the beginning, but yeah. This is okay, quite so old. it basically came around in 87. It was for the 50th anniversary, because mm-hmm. 1938 was when Action Comics number one came out. And um, at the time, I was reading the John Byrne Superman comics. It was one of the comics I was reading regularly every month. And um, this hardcover came out, greatest Superman stories ever told, and I immediately I told my book, the comic book shop, said, you order this for me. And I said, sure. They ordered it. It came in, and they said, when it came in, they phoned me up at my house, and they said, look, this thing is 25 bucks. Do you still want it? And at the time, I was like 12, <laughs> 13 years old, and I was like, oh, man, that's too much. I, I really want it. It had a cool cover, um, but I just couldn't afford it. So um, I I said, no, just sell it. And then I, I kind of regretted that, and I ended up buying the soft cover version many years later, um, and that had a kind of crappier cover, and I still always wanted the um, hardcover, and so I finally, in the last six months, managed to buy one for a decent price after, you know, 25 years or whatever. <laughs> um, so I had that s- the spare, the soft cover, and that's the one I ended up sending to you. Okay, yeah, that's the one I have in front of me here. Um, okay, yeah, now, as I've probably said before... Um, several years ago, last time we talked about Superman. Um, I was never a Superman reader, uh, you know, growing up or whatever. I I think part of the problem might have been that, for me, Superman was the one-dimensional guy on Super Friends. Yeah. Really boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and still, even reading this, uh, occasionally he would say something that seemed out of character to me because mm-hmm. I'm thinking super friend Superman who who is barely human, uh, who barely has a personality. Um, <laughs> and for Superman to to be anything other than kind of resolute, you know, confident, moving straight forward, uh, and, you know, occasionally laughing at really dumb jokes at the end of the adventure... Um, it, uh, anything other than that just doesn't quite seem to fit for me because that's what I got used to. Right. So I think that, but I think that's true of most of the DC heroes hmm. at that at that time. I don't. I think they were all straight arrow. 
Boy Scouts, as they call uh-huh. them, you know, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Arrow, they were all just morally one-dimensional. For yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, even reading the stories in this book from the 40s and 50s, he has more personality than he did on Super. Sure, because he because he was a cold blooded murderer at the <laughs> at the time, yeah. And he was he's giving up he's handing out one liners while he was uh, throwing people off cliffs and you know <laughs> torturing people in other ways. It's interesting um, looking at the table of contents of of this, and they give the years that these comics came out. Well, and there's a whole essay at the beginning by. Well, John Byrne writes several pages and like, quite a few pages, and then Mike Gold writes a few. I think this Mike Gold is the one who wrote about kind of their uh, selection process. Um, but they end up with like some early forties, early to mid forties stuff. Well, it gets into forty eight, and then there's a whole clump of stories from nineteen fifty eight, nineteen sixty three, that time period, mm-hmm. and then it. 70, 72, and then it skips to the 80s. They're they're not kind of evenly spaced. No, it's um, yeah, I don't even know where to begin talking about that. It's a weird collection of <laughs> comics, and some of them are terrible. <laughs> and and the it, there's the choice that like it's really inconsistent. Like um, I think he says in the introduction too, they were like chosen not then the Mike Gold introduction, like how they chose them. Say this committee of people basically come in and people who had some authority, so to speak, on Superman and to vote. Um, but he says like we were trying to choose the best stories, not the most representative or something that effect. Yeah, or, or almost, not to like the most significant events, but just like the highest quality stories, apparently. Right, but then he says like then they said we have it became important to represent as many of the major supporting characters as possible, but that contradicts best <laughs> stories. That's like you're trying to get the most representative mm, stories, mm. and they didn't even choose like the Bizarro story they chose is not a proper Bizarro story. It's a, the Superboy version. And the Supergirl is not the what became the final Supergirl. It's this kind of fantasy genie in a lamp version. Mm-hmm. Um, so the uh, choices were just odd. Yeah, and there odd. there are several in here that are quote unquote imaginary stories, which I guess is what they would call else worlds now, right? Yes, um, it's kind of things that happen outside of continuity. There are a number of them in here, which also seemed a little odd to me. Yeah, um, but those are. I think you'll find those turn out to be the best stories <laughs> um, a lot of the time because the, within the strictures of the the let's say the real stories, you couldn't really there was not much elbow room mm. there wasn't much w- wiggle room you couldn't really do much whereas in the imaginary stories you could kill off Superman or get him married or have him solve problems that if you solve them in the comic would take away. Um, store, sources of stories. For example, the Bottle City of Candor, which you know showed up again and again in story after story. Well, if you ta- if you have him solve the problem of re-enlarging the city and freeing its citizens, you can't go to that well for stories anymore. Mm-hmm. So um, the imaginary stories kind of open things up, I think. Yeah. Well, and then that the same is true of uh, whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow, which is not in this collection, but. Uh, I read that also uh, preparing for this episode. Um, and that's also basically a quote-unquote imaginary story, yeah. right? Because um, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the crap totally hits the fan. You know, people start dying left and right. You know, ma- major characters um, <laughs> kind of all at the same time. Uh, it's an Alan Moore story. Um, was meant to be what, like the the quote unquote last Superman story before Burns' reboot of the character, right? Right, right, right. Um, and we'll get deeper into that one because there's some interesting things about that and it being imaginary and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. um, as well. But um, yeah, but I mean that's one that should have been in this collection. And I think there he might have mentioned a line where like some stories have been reprinted too many times. Mm to warrant inclusion, but I'm like, you know, it's if you're going to choose the best, it doesn't matter if it's been reprinted ten times, there's a reason it has. And there were, I thought, I kind of felt there were a few omissions um, in here as well. Hmm. Well, like, what, uh, what would you have, it. what would you have expected to be in here that wasn't? Um, like, there's, there was, I, 
I'm going to say a lot of dumb things on this episode. I should <laughs> warn you up front. Like, I'm just going to say stuff that's just going to sound stupid. But, like, there's this one where um, Superman goes up to this uh, other planet with a red sun and fights Luther, like, with their shirt, like, bare chested boxing mm. um, out in the wasteland. It's amazing, I thought. Um, uh, the, I, yeah, there's lots of. Uh, there were just a lot of stories like that, and I just found some of the ones that were included in here were so odd and not great mm. um, that I, I could I would have made some of my own substitutions. I think mm. um, I almost I had another one on the tip of my tongue, and now I've forgotten it. Um, there were a couple of Candor ones that were really good. Um, the Superman versus Muhammad Ali was awesome. That's a great comic book. Oh, really? And I guess at the hmm. I guess at the time they didn't want to shrink it down because it was in the treasury size. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can kind of see why, maybe why they didn't, but it's great. Um, and I would have put that in here. Um, but you know, you look at the because there was this is the twenty or fiftieth anniversary, so also around two thousand five they put out two more volumes called. Superman, The Greatest Stories Ever Told, 1 and 2. And then for the 75th anniversary, they put another volume called a Cele- Superman Celebration of 75 Years. And you'll notice there's almost no crossover huh. between the stories in those three volumes. Um, so I guess it, maybe it's kind of hard to choose the best Superman stories. Maybe none of them are any good. Mm. I don't know well, what the problem there is. There have been so many, so. There are, like, I think he mentions here they went through 5,000, or there were 5,000 stories to choose from. That's not counting crossover appearances and other titles. Because hmm. there would be, like, three stories an issue, and there were three titles a month or more or something. Um, so I can kind of understand the madness of trying to choose. But um, some of them, like Superman Red, Superman Blue, I think should be in there every time. Um, I think the two Alan Moore stories should be in there every time. Um, mm, so you you mean uh, whatever happened to Man of Tomorrow and for the man who has everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So true. yeah, the latter is in here, um, and, right? And, and interestingly, it was also included in the collection that that started with whatever happened right. to Man of Tomorrow, which I got right. digitally. Right, right. So um, and that one's been in and out because there's also a collection. DC have also put out two or three collections of every DC story that Alan Moore wrote. Um, but sometimes that includes the killing joke and sometimes it doesn't. Hmm. And it used to include like for the man who has everything now it doesn't cause they put out a deluxe edition or whatever. Hmm. Um, so there's not really, there's no consistency, but my feeling is if you're going to call something the greatest should be mm-hmm. the greatest. Yeah. Um, well, and I assume that, that any book like this that came out now would have all-star Superman in it, wouldn't it? Well, that's ten issues. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's kind it would, of big, I guess. Um, but the other thing they do is, <laughs> some of these collections have like part one, and they do that once in here, I think. Like they do the first part of the of Jack Kirby's Fourth World saga, mm. and it just ends with this oddball kind of cliffhanger. Yeah, I you know, thought like, that was strange. Yeah, what the, the, they they didn't put the whole story in here. They didn't put the whole story in, and it's a weird. It's the first. So it's uh, the Forever People issue one. Actually, he'd done some in, I think, Jimmy Olsen issues first. Um, but Superman's kind of a supporting player in it. It's a really bad example of a Superman, for me, too, because they brought in Jack Kirby. He was supposedly, quote-unquote, editing his own work, but DC had um, uh, Al Plastino and Dick Giordano come in to redraw Superman's face because they didn't like the way Jack Kirby was drawing it. Mm. So it's so it's such a visually weird. I mean, I think they included it because hey, we got a Jack Kirby Superman comic. Yeah. But never it's, mind that it is actually a crossover in a different title. <laughs> it's a crossover. It's not the complete story, and the faces have all been redrawn because DC had no respect for Jack Kirby. So you know, it's probably the last thing you want to put in here. Um. Yeah, very very odd choice that one. But in um, one of the other ones too, they have like. The, I think in the 75th one, they have um, the rebirth of Brainiac story, which is a really cool story drawn by Gil Kane, where the old green skin Brainiac gets reborn as a kind of Terminator-type robot. Um, and I love that Terminator-type robot design of it, and I love that story. It's a really weird kind of cosmic thing. 
Um, but it shows, uh, and at the end of it, like, the new Brainiac lands and knocks Superman down or something, and he's about to kill him, and he's like, now you die, Superman. And at the end it would say, it said, to be continued. Well, when they reprinted it in the 75th anniversary one, they reprinted that story, not part two, and they've taken out the to be continued, so it's just like Superman dies at the hands of Brainiac, as far <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> okay. Very, so, so some very strange choices going on in these collections. One story they put in here, which I think is terrible, is um, the night of March 31st, um, which is this uh -huh. oddball. It's this oddball story where it's just like seven or eight pages, and every there's all this weird stuff in every panel that shouldn't be there. Like, for example, Supergirl is breathing fire, um, and Superman's car is like his identity is, is exposed all the time. Um, just weird things, and like Perry White is a bizarro Perry for no reason. And then it's like, dear readers, can you guess what the answer is? And in this reprint, they haven't told you. It's just, there's no context for it. Like, it, there was a contest where you're supposed to write in with the answer of mm. what you thought, if you could find all the errors, well, and why it was happening. And, you know, if you look it up, you'll figure out, oh, yeah, it's April 1st. Cause yeah, because the, the name of the like story that. is March March 31st. So, but, yeah, yeah so I think, yeah, it's just April Fool's. But, but yeah, it was sort of an... Even in that context, it felt a little odd to me. So, so what makes this an April Fool joke exactly? I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah, what, as, a, as aside from just being an imaginary story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. But then aside, but so apparently this committee voted, and they're like, "This is one of the best Superman stories." I'm like, "No, it's not." Hmm. Um, <laughs> um. So reading this old stuff from the 40s and 50s and 60s, it was interesting because i was actually sort of enjoying the goofiness of it mm. and like you know then reading an 80s alan moore story the sudden kind of seriousness of it becomes jarring right. like all of a sudden these same characters are these same villains are a much worse threat and people are actually you know dying and getting injured and wonder woman gets right. beat up and and you know, before it's just kind of a lark, uh, which I kind of enjoyed. <laughs> but you know, I yeah. know that if if they produce these kinds of stories now, nobody would take it seriously. But um, and part yeah. of it might just be the nostalgia of it. But but yeah, I kind of enjoyed the tone of those earlier stories. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I love those comics, and I kind of realized reading this too. Like, there's the the Mort Weisinger area era it was when things got really bonkers, like, the, and he added all those elements, like, I think some of them might have been already in place, but, like, the Fortress of Solitude and Supergirl and Crypto and the, the shrunken city of Kandor, um, a lot of that stuff was added by, during the Mort Weisinger era, and he was a notoriously a horrible editor who berated his writers and insulted them and apparently would... Uh, a writer would come in and pitch an idea, and he would say, "That's idiotic. Get out of here." And then he would pitch, he would give that same story uh, idea to another writer. Um, and apparently, he was just a, a complete tyrant, awful. And he was in therapy and um, was talking, you know, was talking about how Superman was overshadowed. He was overshadowed in his life by Superman. He had this inferiority complex or whatever. Um, he was a kind of crazy oddball character, and he, the stories from his era are particularly bonkers. Um, in the 70s, I don't think there's much 70s stuff in here, but that was, the 70s, 80s was more my kind of era, um, when I was reading Superman the most was when he was like the news broadcaster, that kind of period. Mm. Um, and those were considered to be a bit more like when they came to the 70s, we're trying to catch up to Marvel a bit and we're trying to be a bit more serious. And there is one story in here, Must There Be a Superman, where it deals with kind of plantation workers and stuff. And you can see they were trying to be a bit more socially conscious mm. um but they're they got very formulaic in that period more so than the more weisinger era where you really didn't know what was going to happen each issue because it was just bonkers in the julie schwartz era his editing he i think he had some rules in there like um there always has to be a threat to superman's secret identity um Steve Lombard always has to pull a prank on Clark Kent, and Clark Kent has to get his comeuppance. 
Um, and it was very kind of routine. Mm. And the bad guys were usually boring, very boring, bald guys in suits that were <laughs> secretly aliens or something. Um, yeah. So that, but so I found like even though that's the kind of stuff I, and that's the, that's the period where Kurt Swan was being inked by Murphy Anderson, and it's really quite beautiful. Probably the most visually attractive, or one of the most visually attractive Superman eras um i find now looking back it's the 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 constant hyperactivity of the the more weisinger stories are the best and they make no sense at all but there's still i i, I kind of see there's still a there's a charm to it and i think i think when alan moore came in i think i think he did kind of like when he especially the last superman story whatever happens to the man of tomorrow he really tried to cram in every Super age, Silver Age element into it, mm -hmm. um, but then he also Alan Moore also wrote a series for forty issues called Supreme, which was a takeover of a Rob Liefeld series, and that he rewrote as his own kind of Superman comic, and that's a real Silver Age tribute, um, and that's an amazing series in itself. Uh, that's worth looking at. That's because uh, he goes through all of it. He adds the dog and the. You know all the multiple universes and all that stuff. He crams it all back in there. It was that's a really great, joyful series. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Mm. Now, um, I'm not. Oh, sorry, I'm not familiar very much with uh, Kirby's DC work. Um, now, I, I guess Darkseid was one of his creations. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because I the first. Well, in the 80s, Paul and I were buying Teen Titans for a while, and Darkseid was in there, although we were reading his name as Darkseid, um, not getting the... I only, you there. know, many people say Darkseid, but I think on the Super Friends cartoon, they called him Darkseid, and that's the only reason I knew, because that was the okay. first place I saw him. Yeah, yeah. I think Super Friends, I really only watched the very first season, I think, in, right. like, 73, so I don't think okay. Dark <laughs> Darkseid was ever... No, he showed up in, like, it. an 80s version when it was called Superpowers. Mm -hmm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I was long over Saturday morning comic cartoons by that time. Right. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you can definitely see that it's Kirby's art. Um, I don't know, I guess, other than Darkseid, did any of his characters like kind of catch on you know are they still oh, used? yeah all the fourth world characters are still used and overused by dc oh, for sure okay every he created he created millions of characters for this whole epic saga and the rug kind of got pulled out from under him um and it got canceled early um he was running four titles basically um and uh but all the characters still show up regularly mm-hmm I see. I don't know. These these forever people almost look like parodies of Kirby characters. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He's batting at a lot of them uh, at that stage. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> like, but they kind of did because he came up with this character called Black Racer, uh, which was this uh, black guy on skis that would fly around. He's like the Silver Surfer. Um, <laughs> but I just thought this is a terrible idea for a character. And I think back home too on Earth, he had an identity on Earth. He was like some. Is he like a, a Vietnam War vet that was like bedridden? I don't know. It was some weird... I was just like, this is not a good idea. Um, and I think there were a few in there, but it was just like the the, uh, the output was incredible, you know, for Kirby. E even even for him. I mean, he was doing four titles or something at the same time, so... Um, the, the ideas were just coming out. It was like a fountain. Mm-hmm. I see. Um, well, let's see... So there's a, there there's a, a lot shift of stories in, this, in here. I'm yeah, yeah. Just not sure how well, to approach the, them. So there's like there's like the 40s stuff where he's still beating up people and stuff. There's the first one with, with Mr. Mixia's Pitalik shows up, and uh, God, there's this line in here that was that was great. I love that Superman almost catches him and he, they're flying in there and he says, "Mr. Mixia's Pitalik, an odd name. I'd hate to be the stone cutter who will have to engrave it on your tombstone." That's great death threats for this little guy who's just like kind of he's not even bad. He's just creating some mischief. Mm. And uh, Superman threatens to kill him. Um, but, um, okay, then we get to the origin of Superman, which is a story drawn by Wayne Boring. Um, and Wayne was an artist who drew a really ugly Superman, um, couldn't draw people flying. Um, but he was kind of like the most iconic 
Superman artist for a long time, and he drew the newspaper strip as well, which kind of helped. Um, but he only drew like two or three faces, and people are never looking at each other in the eyes. They're always like mannequins posed at odd angles, and whenever Superman's flying, it's like he just turned the page sideways and drew a man standing up. Um, <laughs> it, it's weird. Like I really, he, I kind of love his art, but it's kind of terrible. And there's a few Wayne Boring stories in here. And there's okay, and then we get to this magic lamp one. I don't think we need to mention that. It's, they've included, I guess, because it's the first kind of Supergirl, but it's not really. Um, right? Yeah, I did, like you mentioned, I thought that was strange that it's not the Supergirl who normally showed up later. And the same with Bizarro; it's some yeah, other other version of a him. pre-version. Yeah. So then we get to the Clark Kent's college days. This might be the first. Probably not. It's an early Mort Weisinger edited story. And uh, here's where it starts getting, okay, now it's all about the secret identity. And it doesn't matter who gets injured or what or how many lives are threatened, protect the secret identity. And this one's a great one where um, Clark's college professor starts to figure out that he's Superman and puts him through a series of tests. And this happens. It even happened in the previous story. Maybe that's the, the, because the bad guys figure out that Superman's lost his powers. So as often he has to go through like three tests where he has to prove that he's not Superman or whatever. Mm. So he has to find some clever way around it. But there's some great lines in here like the professor's about to show this test of how gravity works by dropping some um, cannon ball, not or dropping some balls off the a replica of the Leaning Tower of Pisa on Smallville. University <laughs> they just happen to have it sitting there. They just happen to have it there. And uh, he gives this line, which he said to Clark, says, By the way, Kent, I received a phone call from some crank. He said he'd substituted a cannonball with an explosive charge for one of mine. But I'm ignoring him. The end. Go ahead with the test. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, totally crazy. Then there's a crazy, another crazy story. They just get crazier at this in the, during the 60s, 50s and 60s. The mm. super key to Fort Superman. This is the one where we see inside the fortress. Um, he's got. You see how weird everything is. But the funny thing is, at the time, like, as kids, you thought these were totally awesome elements. But it, now you read, it's just weird. Like he's got statues of all his friends um, <laughs> in there. He's as got you this, do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, he's got a painting. Oh, yeah, there was some weird, like, there's no uh, problem with the Weisinger stories is there's no, I don't know if we should call it a problem, because I kind of enjoy it, but there's no internal consistency sometimes. Hmm. Like, um, he was painting this, he's doing a painting of a Martian landscape that he's observed by telescopic vision, but why has he done it, like, he can fly around. <laughs> like, I think later in the story hmm. even flies well, somewhere... Well, so why, are, why are the Grinch's hands coming out of the ground in that? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was another detail in here. Like, he mentioned how he'd flown to some other planet and gotten something. I'm like, why, why don't you just fly to Mars? Why are you doing this by telescope? Mm. Um, but then at the end, it turns out that Batman has been sneaking into his uh, fortress as a as a present. He snuck in by lock, by hiding himself inside the key that opens it. And then um, he gives him a giant cake which says, Happy Anniversary Superman. The candles, I mean, Bruce Wayne has made all this stuff. He's made a giant cake. <laughs> he's made a giant knife for Superman. And he's made these candles that each one alternates, has a face of Clark and Superman going around. <laughs> and he says, I baked it myself. I hope you don't need super strength to cut it. He said, And then Superman's response is, don't worry, I can eat solid steel. What does that have to do with cutting it? <laughs> Eating solid steel? It's just like, what are you... It's just a, like a rain of, a barrage of facts that kids will love about, you know, like, oh, look at the size of that cake and the candles and Superman can eat steel. That's awesome. Even though it has nothing to do mm. with. Well, yeah. And I, I love the image of Batman in a department store shopping for a gift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a yeah. great panel. Yeah. It's, uh. But yeah, I mean, but but then Batman what transported all this stuff up to the North Pole to the fortress? That's he. Oh, you're right. He must have had to bake it in the fortress <laughs> while Superman was running. And he, but he had the, the cake, cake mix in his utility belt, or I don't know, man. <laughs> it's yeah, Bat yeah, cake mix. <laughs> 
bizarre. <laughs> totally weird. And he was hiding as a statue, and supposedly Superman didn't notice that Batman was the... Anyway. Um, okay, then we get to this Bizarro one, which I didn't like, because, you know, the Bizarro stories are... The Superman ones, not the Superboy Bizarro stories, are some of the funniest, best Superman stories. There's a whole collection of those called Tales of the Bizarro World, mm. uh, which is great fun. And this is just kind of an oddball... It, and this one was so weird, too. Like, see, Bizarro falls in love with this blind girl, and she kind of likes him. And Superboy tricks Bizarro by creating a dummy of her, which he's manipulating like a mannequin with wires. Just so <laughs> weird, even when she flies away with him. Mm, yeah, some of, some of them were really weird or just, like, you know, so implausible. Like, the one where... Um, I think it's a little earlier on where uh, he's lost his powers, but he's trying to hide the fact. And so he has, yeah, yeah. like, Jimmy Olsen uh, <laughs> supporting him on this, like, pole that's coming out of a window. About How is he supposed right. to fly forward <laughs> if <laughs> the stick is coming out yeah. the window? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, t- Totally. Totally. But these were like one panel solutions that kids were like, ah, oh, that's great. Well, actually, they would, the kids would write in letters and be like, I caught you, you made a mistake. And uh, the editors would come up with some long winded explanation for how it was possible. Um, yeah, it was an oddball. <laughs> that was one of the first ones. That was Mort Weisinger, you can tell. It was always like Superman trying to prove that he doesn't have powers. He has to go through a series of tests or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um. Then we got the girl in Superman's past. This is the one where um, he meets Lori Lamaris, the mermaid, uh, from his college days, this story. And this is a pretty... I think this is a pretty great story. I think Wayne Boring tends to have that same Superman looking depressed in every panel and looking off-panel into the corner again and again and again, which mm-hmm. was his thing. And, uh, again, he can't draw Superman flying. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there's on page 146, there's Superman's carrying six people, and they're all just, like, in a row, three on each side. <laughs> like, w- <laughs> just bonkers. Yeah, um, his arms are not that long. <laughs> yeah. Um, then there's a great story that I love, because it was so dumb, called Superman's Other Life. And um, this is another Wayne Boring, one with Wayne Boring art, where, um, so for some reason... Um, Superman brings Batman and Robin up to the fortress. Oh, it's a gift. There's a lot of ones where Superman's getting presents, including the Alan Moore story. Um, Batman and Robin show up to give him a present, and it's uh, some pictures of Krypton. Um, okay, so he Superman feeds these pictures into his computer to figure out what his life would have been like um, if he had not left Krypton. And then the, if Krypton hadn't exploded. And then the fun begins. So there's a, on page 150 at the bottom, it says, Solar System of Krypton, 3 million light years from, I'm guessing, Earth. Mm. Now, keep that, in, keep that little fact in mind, because that fact was written down by the people who wrote this story. Mm. So, now later on, so he, gets, he sees what his life would have been on Krypton, and there's one thing where they're doing a science experiment, or he's in the Boy Scouts, and they have to do a good deed. So they look through a, a telescope at Earth, and um, little Kal-El on Superman sees his parents, who the people who would have adopted him on Earth, about to plunge into a lake and die. And he turns on a beam that dries up the lake uh, from Krypton, and then the people are saved. So the car doesn't plunge into the lake. Now, they've already established themselves in this story that it's 3.5 million light years away. That means anything you look at through that telescope is going to be what Earth looked like 3.5 million years ago. Um, Not what is happening this moment. And also, somehow he's able to turn on a beam and dry up a lake (laughs) from 3.5 million light years away? (laughs) What? Um... And, uh, you know, the funny thing is, like, a lot of these stories were, like, he hired, Moore Weisinger hired actual science fiction writers um, to come in. Uh, So they kind of knew, or they should have known what they were doing, and I think they just really had no respect for the intelligence of the kids. They just really thought the kids were idiots. Mm. Um, Yeah, so there's another great thing that happens in this story is... um, 
<laughs> a a spaceship a, a spaceship random spaceship lands on Krypton. The people get out. It turns to be some Earthmen and Lois Lane who snuck aboard. So um, when they when the Earth astronauts get out, Superman says to them, "Why? Well, I recognize your speech and know your origin. You're men from Earth." And he says, "That's right. We meant to land on our moon, but shot past in outer space, finally reaching a world." Hang on. So they went for the moon, ended up 3.5 million light years away <laughs> on another planet. 3.5 million light years. They <laughs> shot past the moon, and they went that far. They didn't turn around. The moon is w- literally one light second away from Earth. Um, and then they find out that uh, they have a stowaway. It's Lois Lane. S- Lois Lane gets. <laughs> I love this. It's on page 169. Lois Lane gets out of this plane. This this rocket ship that's shot past the moon to Krypton, and says, "I saw from a po- porthole how you saved our ship, Futuro." You're a man with superpowers. What a scoop that'll be on Earth. You have landed on an alien planet <laughs> where people are seemingly humanoids, identical to humans. They look exactly humans. And her thing is she's met someone with superpowers. <laughs> of all the things that have happened, this is the thing. She's like, I got a scoop for the Daily Planet. <laughs> There's a man with superpowers on this alien planet we actually landed on that's 3.5 million light years away. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. (laughs) Coming up, swimming the interplanetary water spout. Glasses? What's the real difference between Clark and Superman? The symbolism of the ads in the original printing of Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. And more. First, if you're enjoying this podcast, help us attract new listeners by giving us a review on iTunes or other podcast sites. And why not support the show to help us achieve bigger and better things? You can make a one-time donation via PayPal, sending it to the email donate at deconstructingcomics.com, or become a monthly donor via Patreon by going to patreon.com slash deconcomics. You like cheap comic books, right? Well, I'm Professor Allen, and I talk about cheap comic books on the Quarterbin Podcast. In every episode, I'll dissect a single comic from my collection as long as I paid no more than 25 cents for the issue. Forget about $4 new comics that you can read in four minutes, or crossover events that can cost 100 bucks to collect. Join me in the quarter bin, where even bad comics are a bargain, and good ones are a steal. The Quarter Bin Podcast is part of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network. Visit us at relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com or search Relatively Geeky or Quarterbin Podcast in iTunes. I guarantee it'll be worth every penny. I understand, though, that the writers... I think one of the, one of the intros said that different writers placed Krypton in different parts of the universe and it kind of was sometimes near Earth and sometimes far from Earth. I th- yeah, I think in the first days it was in our solar system. Yeah, well, that was interesting, too, because uh, it was pointed out that um, at the beginning, that uh, at that time, they thought that the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter might have been a planet that blew up, and so this was sort of tying into that, that maybe that was Krypton. Right. Um but and then, I mean, later it was just, like in the seventies they proved that there never was a planet there, or they decided that. But uh, right. but yeah, it was interesting that uh, that there was that idea at that time, and that this was tying in with that. Um, yeah, something we can't no, really. I think appreciate that's kind now. of more. Yeah, I think that's almost more interesting than saying it's three point five million years <laughs> away, and then forgetting that, forgetting that you've written that. <laughs> Um, or, or just not even understanding what that means, what a light year is, and how far away it is, and how you can't look at stuff in a telescope and see what's happening, or dry up a lake, or shoot mm. past the moon and yeah, end well, up there just, by accident. It's just kind of throwing out a big number that sounds impressive and not really thinking about what it means. I mean, Paul yeah. and I have been talking about that. It comes up occasionally on the Batman TV show where they'll say, like, I'll turn this up to however many thousands of decibels, which, you know, in actuality would kill a human, but 
and you know it's louder than the the loudest recorded sound ever but you know it doesn't matter just throw out a large number of decibels and it sounds impressive right right right, <laughs> right. um okay so then there are two i think great stories because um i think the imaginary ones are much better lex Lu- the uh, death of superman one uh where lex luther pretends to go straight and you believe it mm. uh, and he cures oh, yeah. cancer and all sorts of stuff and it's great and him and Superman becomes friends, and you're like, this is so great. And then he turns around and murders Superman, just cold-blooded murders, and makes his friends watch. Locks <laughs> them in the next room and makes them watch. And it's so cruel and amazing. Um, and, um, yeah, and then, uh, so they finally catch, so Supergirl has to become active. She's been in hiding until this stage, and... Um, take over. That's a and it's got great Kurt Swan, George Kleinart, just the best. Like the faces and um, it's just really great to look at too. And I just love that one. And that's one that deserves being every collection. And I think it, that one might be in all of them. Mm. Okay. And then after that is the Superman Red, Superman Blue story. Yeah, <laughs> I think this is a great one too. <laughs> um, it's another imaginary story. Again, it's by. Kurt Swan and George Klein. Oh, maybe the... Yeah, that, that, that's um, right. And story by Leo Dorfman. Right, okay. This is a great, bonkers story. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the people of Candor basically guilt Superman for not fixing all the problems he was supposed to fix. Um, and he's like, well, geez, I really got to do something about this. And they say, oh, we're going to replace you. We're going to send someone else out there to replace you. Why not just send a few people out and they can all work as Superman together? Anyway, <laughs> somehow they can only somehow they can only send one at a time for whatever bonkers reason. So uh, Superman invents this machine, which he doesn't know what it's going to do, but he fills it with all the types of kryptonite, and he says, "I don't know what this is going to do, but it's going to help me solve all the problems I need to solve." So he goes in there, he comes out as two Superman, red and blue, um, and then as always happens in these stories, there are a bunch of super feats. Um, so he rebuilds Krypton, and, uh, Kandor is released up there. He creates a ray, this I couldn't understand at all, and creates a ray which will wipe out evil. Um, (laughs) and he sets up these satellites in orbit, and these satellites, you know, shoot out this ray, and suddenly nobody's evil anymore. I don't know how this stops future evil or what, um, I don't really know if it's morally, if it's ethically right to wipe out evil with the beam that, um, I don't know, what is evil? They never even, that's not even really a question these kids, you know, would have. Like, what is the definition of evil? What is this world without evil in it? Very strange. He creates a serum, uh, or sorry, Lex Luthor works on a serum, a super serum, which will cure every known disease. And Superman analyzes it and says it's the most effective antibiotic ever, including... Curing baldness. I did not know antibiotics could do that. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, the anti-evil ray also cures uh, Khrushchev and, and uh, Castro. Right. Castro releases all the prisoners, and Khrushchev dumps all his mis- missiles in the ocean. Oh, it's great. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and then Superman decides to get married, and then, interestingly, Kurt Swan, um, the faces have been redrawn by uh, Kurt Schaffenberger, who drew the Lois Lane comics, so... I think Mort Weisinger really, he obsessed over this story a lot, I think. I think because he was very picky about making sure that Lois and Lana looked like they did in the Lois Lane book. And they're, they're quite pretty. Um, and Kurtz was always good, too. But it's right, interesting that they've got those weird redrawn faces. Well, not weird, but maybe you can notice that they're a little bit out of place. Hmm. Um, but there's a, this amazing ending where... You know, who, am I going to marry Kurt or Lana? There's now two Supermen. They're like, well, we'll marry one each. And then they get married one each, and one moves off to live on... Mm, on Krypton. Uh, new Krypton. Yeah. New Krypton, and the other decides to live on Earth. And it's happily ever after, and it's just wild. What a wild, amazing amount of stuff happened in 20 pages. <laughs> it doesn't really make sense. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a thing, too, where he shoots all the... Oh, yeah, he, he saves Atlantis, where Lori Lamaris is. Mm by creating a, a water tunnel up to another planet <laughs> using the water on Earth. So he spins it in a spiral. Apparently there's enough water on Earth <laughs> to create a tunnel. And the like magnetic um, field keeps the funnel intact so they can swim all the way there. I mean, <laughs> right. 
what? Would, they, wouldn't they get tired? I mean, that's a long yeah, they're distance gonna swim to swim. to another planet. I forgot. I didn't even think about that. They have to swim to the other planet. <laughs> it's not sucking. It's there. not sucking them there. They have to, you know, under their own power, <laughs> swim there. <laughs> oh, well, that's yeah. It's the most bonkers. And where, I think he even mentions like where this new water planet is. It's like so he. He uses it, they pour on their heat vision, the two Superman, Supergirl, and Crypto, the Superdog, pour on their heat vision on this ice planet, or some planet where they melt the polar ice caps. Um, they're scanning for a, a, a suitable planet. I think they even mentioned, like... It's the Memorial Planet. What's that? We need a new memorial now that Krypton is restored. Oh, that's right. There, there, there was no some need. kind of a... Oh, there's no need for a memorial now that Krypton is... Okay, there was on. some sort of a Krypton memorial planet uh, that they right, don't need right, anymore right, now right, that right. there's new Krypton. Okay, right. So it's like a fake Krypton... I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, it's a memorial world of Krypton, which I once helped you build. Um, I wish I knew where it was, but yeah, it, they yes. keep talking about the vast gulfs of space, and anyway, they're going to swim to this water planet through a funnel. The Earth is still blue despite all the water that's been sucked up into space. <laughs> Crazy. Just craziness. Um, got it? Yeah, I loved it. Um, <laughs> deserves to be there every time, I think. Mm. Um, right, then we've got the Jack Kirby story. Um... Then we've got, oh, Monster Be Superman, so I think I mentioned that. This is, I think maybe one of the, besides the Kirby one, this is kind of one from the 70s. You can see both these stories, it's like, and Superman's like, should I be helping people or should I be making them help themselves uh, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a Kurt Swan, Murphy Anderson story, so the art's really great in it. Um, I just kind of doubt the, so what's going on? There's this plantation... Um, and the, the workers want Superman to help them, and he's like, you've got to help yourselves. And then there's an earthquake, so... Yeah, and then he has, he has to, to help, help them, because they can't handle that by themselves. Right. And then he feels kind of awkward telling them to help themselves now that there's been an earthquake. And... Right. <laughs> and now we've got ten years of Superman questioning himself, um, basically, in all the Julie Schwartz era comics. Mm, I see. Well, not, not, uh, not all the time, but it's kind of this era where... Certainly, especially what's happening in Green Lantern, Green Arrow, where they had the kind of drug issues and stuff. Mm -hmm. and I think they were, it was kind of a, I mean, they couldn't go on with that oddball 60s stuff forever, of course, and they were falling way behind Marvel, but, I mean, just in terms of the quality of the content, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know if this is really the right direction. Um, you know, about the 60s stuff, John Robertson made a really great, quote about the 60s comics and how bonkers they were and he said um what was he said it, he said it was like it was reads like little kids making up as they go along while playing pretend <laughs> like it's just one thing after another i thought it was just so perfect mm -hmm. on the on our facebook page yeah the, especially those imaginary stories definitely feel that way like well let's do this and then let's do this yeah, too yeah. and let's do this and yeah and it's so out there like that water funnel to a different planet yeah. I mean, yeah, you can imagine little kids coming up with that and yeah. and not considering the science that makes it impossible. Just, right. you know, this would work because we want it to. Yeah. And it's just this cool, amazing thing that happens, mm. and you, they're assuming the kids won't be smart enough to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, well, let's skip the, the Alan Moore one for now because we'll get to that in the other book. Um, but the last one in here is a, at the time pretty current John Byrne era Superman comic. And I was buying these off the shelf when they came out. Um, and yeah, uh, this the, one the is... The Secret from, Revealed. This one is from issue two of the John Byrne series. Okay. Uh, inks by Terry Austin. John Byrne drew a great Superman. I, especially flying. I just love the barrel rolls and hmm. just the acrobatics of it. I just thought it was great. Yeah, you know, wow, seeing Burn and Austin like this, I, I kept expecting X-Men to show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, right. <laughs> um, I think Austin was definitely Burn's best inker. I, especially if you see Burn ink himself, it's really muddy, and mm. there's not nearly enough detail in there. Mm -hmm. And somehow, they had such good synergy, I felt. Um, but this is a great 
this is a great choice, I think. I think it's a ge- legitimately good choice of stories from that era. Um, where um, basically Lex Luthor knows there's some Superman connection in Smallville. He knows there's some sort of Clark Kent connection. He thinks they're friends or brothers or cousins or something. And he's trying to figure it out. So he has people break into the Kent home and steal like his photo albums and stuff. Um, Lana Lang gets beat up as these guys are looking for information. Lex Luthor is seriously cruel, um, womanizer, like really a horrible human being in it. I love that aspect of it too. Um, and he feeds all this information to a computer, and uh, the computer outputs Clark Kent as Superman. And uh, <laughs> it's the best. It's the best. So, so Lex Luthor's assistant is like, this is, of course it makes perfect sense. And Lex Luthor is like, this is. This is idiotic. No, this is not right. No man, he says, I know that no man with the power of Superman would ever pretend to be a mere, hu- mere human. <laughs> and it's just like, that's it. He throws out the results. Great. It was so great. <laughs> yeah, I have no place in my or- organization for people who cannot see the obvious. Yes. <laughs> so I yeah, guess, I guess great, it's time for him to resign line. then. <laughs> that's a great line. Um yeah, I would. Uh, I'm happy. I could talk about the secret identity yeah. this all day. I thought that that story was a little weird in that for most of it, um, it's kind of dark, and then it ends on that kind of goofy joke note. It, it was a, a little surprising to me how it ended. It is a yeah. It's a very dark story because he forces that woman to come have a date with him, and, and he obviously slept with her that night. Um, and Lana gets beat up, and the Kents are, you know, shot with tranquilizer, and it's very dark. And I kind of think the ending, I don't know how out of place it is, because I kind of think you see the megalomania of Lex Luthor in those final assumptions. And it is, there is kind of a laugh in there, um, especially reading it now, like 30 years later. Mm. But um, I think at the time, it kind of, I do think it, it does gel with the rest of the, the story. Um, and it kind of sees how Lex is different from us because we can see the obvious. But um, yeah, I could. I love the. I love talking about the secret identity of Superman. It, <laughs> <laughs> like, because um, there have been so many explanations for it over the years. Like, um, they once had a story in the '70s in the Julie Schwartz era where it was like he was subconsciously super hypnotizing people hmm. to see Clark as a kind of wa- a more gaunt kind of guy. Hmm. Um, and himself is differently, and they they threw that that was never mentioned again because I think people don't like the idea of a less handsome Clark Kent. Um, but that was a weird thing, and um, I, I there was an episode of Lois and Clark that I really loved where this time traveler showed up who knew that Clark was Superman, and he confronted Lois like, and he has these glasses and he's like, he puts them on he's like Clark Kent takes them off Superman Clark Kent Superman. Are you an idiot? Uh, uh, it was really great. But there was I noticed something. I read a lot of... Because um, I've read a lot of Lois Lane comics, especially. But the glasses were never a disguise um, in those comics. Because often, like... Or not often, but sometimes he'd get water splashed on them and he would take them off. Mm. And he would go to costume parties dressed up as Superman <laughs> um, with his glasses on or whatever. And people would be like, no, because no, the thing was, and everybody would say all the time, oh, everybody knows that Superman looks like Clark Kent. Like it was just a common, it was common knowledge. Mm. And I think the super I, the identity, the secret identity was that Clark was a clumsy goofball mm. and Superman was an awesome guy. And what era are you talking about here? That would have been like in the 60s. Okay. Um, and then in the 70s, I think the great thing was in the Superman movie with Christopher Reeve, there's that moment where he's about to tell Lois that he's Superman, and you can see, like, he when he's Clark, he's hunched over, and then he, like, strains his back up, and his posture changes completely, and he's Superman, and he's about to tell her, and it's really, that one moment was really amazing. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, so there have been a lot of explanations over the year. I think this was kind of the best one... Well, not that. Maybe it's the only one from the John Byrne era. It's been rebooted now. I don't know anything about the what they're doing with it these days. Actually, I think he's been exposed in the current Superman comics. So, anyway, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think that was a neat. 
it was a good John Byrne story. I think a lot of people don't like the John Byrne era, and it kind of uh, you know mentioning the um, secret identity business, um, which is covered in this story. I think this is the one where is this one where he goes for a jogging date? Maybe that's in another. Mm. So there was a story from this era where he. I mean, Superman, uh, Clark Kent was an athlete in the John Byrne era, so there was not as much difference um, physically between Clark and Superman. Uh, like, everybody knew he was really buff. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, he makes a point here somewhere where he's always blurry when he's being photographed, like he kind of vibrates so that people can't get a clear photograph of him. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's probably enough of me prattling on about that <laughs> stuff that no one cares about. Okay, well, should we talk about the, the more stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so the uh, for the man who has everything, uh, the artist is Dave Gibbons, and it it's totally feels like reading Watchmen with the DC Universe characters <laughs> in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's so, you know, unmistakable Gibbon style. Yeah, except they're not in the the grid. But right. he does do that kind of he does do the kind of trick where he changes scenes by showing someone's face in the same position mm-hmm. or the same dialogue overlapping or yeah. something like that. Mm-hmm. So there's some Watchmen tricks in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not so that nine panel grid, no. Right. And he draw Gibbons draws a great Wonder Woman, which is something I never really picked up on the previous few times I've read this. Um, but that was really great. Um, so basically, this is a story where um, uh, it's Superman's birthday, and um, Batman, Robin, and Wonder Woman show up to give him presents. And uh, when they get there, they at the fortress, and when they get there, they find that there's some sort of plant which has bonded itself to him. And Superman is having hallucinations of his life on Krypton if he uh, had never left. Um, and it's quite dark because, you know, his father, Jor-El, has joined these political extremists. Um, yeah, I thought this was weird because uh, it's shown that this plant, this uh, plant that, uh, who's this villain? What's his name? Mongol. Mongol. That Mongol is introduced there. It's supposed to uh, make you see your heart's desire. But right. the, you know... It's I, not his heart's desire. Yeah, I mean, be, maybe <laughs> being on Krypton still... Might be, but what's happening in Krypton is all wrong. It's all dark and messed up. It's almost like that story where Batman and Robin show up and give him a present, and he puts it into he puts the photos into the computer, and he sees the projection of what life would have been like on Krypton if it hadn't exploded. Mm-hmm. It's a very similar structure, and it's almost like the plant is not giving him his deepest wish, but instead is giving him what life extrapolating what life would have been. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but when when the plant attaches he, yeah. itself to other characters, they really do see their heart's desire. Right, that's true. It's just with Superman that it's messed up. Yeah, it's it it is odd. But maybe I don't know. Maybe if it had stayed on Batman for longer, it would have gotten dark as well. We don't know. I don't know. You yeah, know. I suppose we don't get to see as you right. know, as much of but, that. But Superman figures out that it's a hallucination. Somehow he works out that he's not. This is really happening they managed to pull the thing off of him then there's a great fight for like 20 pages um uh, superman versus mongol and uh robin saves the day basically at the end um which is uh pretty cool but the thing that there's some interesting things in other ways you know in those watchmen kind of ways is that um it's quite dark um and it's taken kind of these concepts that were really kids' concepts and made them quite dark. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing, too, is like, I mean, it mentions that Superman is married on... Krypton is married to Lyra, Lyra, Lila LaRolle. And she was this um, movie star on Krypton um, that Superman once accidentally flew back in time in one of the 60s stories, flew back in time by accident, went to Krypton, and fell in love with this movie star. She only ever appeared in that one story. Huh. And I don't know how often it's ever been reprinted, but for Alan Moore to pull that rabbit out of the hat um, in the 80s, out of nowhere, it's pretty amazing, <laughs> I thought. like well, it's That his, is an his, obscure... His typical encyclopedic knowledge of pop culture. 
Yeah, yeah, or at least pop culture of Superman yeah, comics at turn that time. Turn to eleven. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of the other things were mentioned um, in other obscure Superman comics as well. Mm. Um, yeah, like that kind of cult that appears and right. Yeah, some of that stuff might be from something else. I don't know, but uh, the fight is just great. It's you know, knockdown, drag out fight. There's a fam- very famous panel where Superman says "burn" and just shoots his heat vision at Mongol in the chest. It's awesome. Um, hmm. Anything else you want to say about this one? Just that uh, I mean, Mongol gets gets to see his heart's desire at the end, but. I mean, it's inherently messed up. So, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, if it went wrong, would that mean that good things started happening, or like that he? I guess um, it would mean that he lost power in his imagination. There was something like that that happened in um, in Judge Dredd versus Batman, where uh, the Judge Death got hit by the Scarecrow's fear gas. And he saw all, like, fluffy bunnies and deer frolicking in the woods and stuff like that. Uh, it was pretty funny. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. Mongols' worst would be, yeah, would be to have no, no power, I guess. <laughs> um, there are a lot of great touches in the story that I can't, I'm not even remembering at the moment. Um, oh, I love that Batman called Robin Chum at the first. Clean, clean, clean mm, thoughts yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. It felt really 1960s. Like TV yeah, show. Yeah, a great, great touch. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So the other story um, in this collection is Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. This was... Um, okay, so it was originally, as you mentioned before, the final two issues of the pre-crisis era Superman, and it was after this was replaced by the John Byrne series. Um... It was originally reprinted, there was a version, a deluxe version that came out around 1997. Hmm. Um, That's a terrible edition. Um, I'll tell you why. There is a great, a very famous passage at the start where uh, Alan Moore starts out with, this is an imaginary story which may have never happened, but then again may, which is what all the imaginary stories usually started with. Um, and then at the end of, and then he describes the things that, you know, this is going to be about this that happened to Superman and this and this. And then he says, this is an imaginary story, aren't they all? Um, which is such a great line, Mm -hmm. um, about how, yeah, they're, they're all imaginary stories and, you know, how important the stories are. Um, that line was taken out of the 1997 edition. Huh. That caption... I think at the time, DC, I can almost, I can picture the, these slimy executives at DC saying, we can't admit that our stories are made up. <laughs> so you have to take out this line about, aren't they all? We don't um, want to tell the kids that Santa Claus doesn't exist. <laughs> that's right. We can't admit that these Superman stories didn't happen. So uh, take out that line. Um, or maybe they were thinking since it, crisis, this was the last post-crisis story, it's in continuity. I don't know what stupid reason they had. Um, but that's such a thematically important, rich line of, of narrative, mm. uh, which they took out. Okay, so anyway, that's back in here. Um, this is a story, so as you described before, it's about all of Superman's... Uh, villains coming back and um, it's kind of crunch time and they're all it's kind of, it's great because Superman um, sorry Superman, Alan Moore has kind of brought back all the things he loved from the Silver Age like, you know, even the old Metallo and um, the Legion of Superheroes Um, and they all they all kind of, and so it's told from the future when Superman has disappeared mm-hmm. um and so this reporter comes to interview lois lane 10 years in the future and she has married this guy this other guy whose name is uh jordy elliott or something like that um and she tells the story of what happened um there's a great thing where brainiac has merged with lex luther to i mean this is a super a super super villain it's a great idea um 
there's some stuff here like Perry White and his wife are having marital troubles, which you could never. And that would have never happened <laughs> in the old DC days. No. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a great moment where Superman walks in on Perry White where he's kind of getting ready for bed. And he's, you know, he mentions how being cooped up in here must be a strain for you and Alice. Um, you know, that's kind of a, there were some real human moments in here. Mm -hmm. Um, and Superman's really, he feels like his death is coming and he's afraid, like he's afraid he's going to die. Mm hmm. Um, and, uh, then it turns out that Mixius Pitalik, the most ridiculous of villains, is the main villain. Um, and he's like this big super evil guy. Uh, they, that's very, I think that's kind of very much, you know, you think of Alan Moore's stories from that era. He was often taking ridiculous things and making them quite serious and dark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of the pattern at the time. Um, but then, um, so Superman ends up killing Mixius Pitalik? Yeah. How do we kill him? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he ripped him in half, basically, and uh, by through some magic tricks. And um, he says nobody has the right to kill, and he goes into a gold kryptonite room to strip himself of his powers. And then there's a back exit, and nobody knows where he goes. And then finally, at the end, um, you see Lois and uh, Jordy's baby... Um, who has that kind of black blue hair that Superman always had? Um, <laughs> crunch up a piece of coal into a diamond, and then Jordy winks at the reader, and it's a great moment. Mm. Um, yeah, I was kind of starting to wonder if that was how it was going to end about halfway through, but all right, <laughs> I kind of yeah. saw it coming. Not a hundred percent. I wasn't sure, but yeah. Um. That was great. I don't know. I think it, after you mentioned the story was dark, I think it, I kind of think he took Mixius Pitalik too far because mm. um, he's kind of a goofball character. But I think it's really a great epic finale to that era of Superman stories. Um, the thing I don't like about this presentation of it is I think this story is about like I just said, about that era, about the 60s and 70s era. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's even drawn by Kurt Swan, both issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the problem is it's on this really nice, glossy paper. The colors have reproduced beautifully. Um, but I think it was also kind of about the end of those comic books. Those comic books with the ads for... Mile High Comics and 3D Glasses <laughs> and all that stuff in there. And when you read these issues, and I found this has been collected twice now. There's the 97 issue. There's this nice hardcover with the cover redrawn by Brian Bolland, um, which is very pretty, but it's not what those comics were. Like, I still have the individual issues because to me it's, there's, it's still about the staples and the ads and the crappy paper and the dots and the colors. Mm. And that's it's kind of, it's not just about the story and the characters. It felt like it was about a lot more than that. And I'll tell you an amazing thing is like on the cover that if you buy the actual issue of 583, so on here it's um, on page 35. They've still left the price, the old price box that says September 86 and approved by the Comics Code. But down in the UPC box, they've blanked it out. And in the direct market edition of this comic, it has. Who watches the Watchmen? Oh. Now, I can't think of any more. It's a little ad for Watchmen in there. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any more ironic ad on the cover of the final <laughs> Silver Age Superman issue written by the same guy. The same guy wrote both of these. And the cover of the, uh, the Superman issue is an ad for Dark Knight Returns. Mm. You know, like, yeah, come the, on. the two most pivotal comics of that Are, era. Exactly. Pivotal and just game-changing, and we're not doing any kids' stuff anymore. From now on, our comics are going to be dour and depressing. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's so symbolic. And, I mean, I, I, was, I only really noticed it when I was rereading this a few weeks ago, and I, I, was, I was kind of pulled out those individual issues, and I was like, this says, who watches The Watchmen on the front? <laughs> Uh, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a meaningful thing. And having all those crappy ads in there and stuff, 
that me mean- I feel like that means something. Like there's a physical meaning to mm. to reading the comics in that form, and that's still true of a lot of comics that Alan Moore writes. Often the individual issue is written in that in a specific way that it's a little parcel of narrative that you're getting and it, it makes a little bit of that is taken away when it's collected and i feel even more is taken away if you collect it on this this particular story on nice glossy paper mm. with a new brian bolland cover I feel like kind of as certain and this is one of the things i was warning you earlier i was going to say a bunch of dumb things in this episode <laughs> this is maybe the dumbest thing i can say about it but i feel like it's better i feel like it has more for me a more emotional energy in a crappier format. <laughs> no, I, I, I see exactly what you mean. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that would, that much more symbolizes the changing of eras besides the content of the story itself. Yes. Cause I feel like the content, this story, not as bad as the 97 edition, but they're like, here's an awesome Superman story. And they're not really, it's less about the end of an era. And it's more like, I don't know, like the trade paperback craze. Or I, you know, I, it's something else. It's, um, mm. It, it's because it's, it's Alan Moore. Yeah, yeah. I just it's got Alan Moore's name on the cover, and DC won't work with him anymore, so they've got to just keep reprinting this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not as bad as taking out. Aren't they all? This is an imagined story. Aren't they all in the opening caption? At least they've retained that this time. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't know. Something about it just doesn't. It's not perfect for me. And I felt like the original, even though it was dark, was kind of a perfect fitting end for that era of Superman. Hmm. Hmm. I see. Okay. Um, well, I, I emailed you well, you know, a few days ago saying that this is reading these stories was educational for me and that I wish yeah. that I had read them before I read Morrison's action right. comics yeah. <laughs> because, you know, the, the new 52 stuff was theoretically supposed to be, you know, a good starting point for new readers, but, they had to be new readers who had enough background knowledge of Superman, which I didn't. And yeah. I was still you know, repeatedly lost. I mean, well, part of it was just the way it was written. Um, you know, part of it was just Morrison. But uh, there were things in there that he was assuming readers knew that I didn't. Um, like, I think right. I was not aware of Candor at all, even. Okay, right, um, right. And I think I I didn't know anything about Brainiac. I think, doesn't Brainiac show up at, like, the end of the first issue or something? Like, I don't know what's going on, because he's not right. actually named. <laughs> right. Um, and, yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it's kind of hard to for them to make a story that's really good for new completely new readers yeah. um so i mean yeah. you have even, to read something like this first to kind of get the background even if even if you i can think even the silver age stories even an eight page story i don't think you could read those raw because i mean the, you know a flying cat's going to show up and you're like what's what the hell what is this thing <laughs> but if you read a bunch of superman comics you might know who this is you might know who the, the bottle city is because otherwise they just mention it and that's what the continuity what they called continuity or what we would call continuity was about superman comics was what's all the stuff he has and who are all the people mm. that populate mm. it wasn't really an issue to issue thing but you had to you did have you had to have pre-knowledge mm. um yeah yeah um should we talk about the swamp thing story in here as well because that's the other superman story which dc which uh Alan Moore wrote. Ah, uh, yeah, the other one that's collected with the uh, Man, Man of there, Tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been a while ago that I read it. I didn't get it get a chance to reread it. Um, let's see what happens in that. So that's where Superman. So this 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 uh, mold. This this scientist has found an asteroid with a mold on it. Oh yes. And uh, Clark Kent goes to report on it. And it turns out, uh-oh, it's from Krypton, which means it's a super mold. And uh, Superman gets infected with it, and uh, he starts hallucinating and losing his powers and stuff. And he decides to drive south. He gets a car. Um, he doesn't have his Clark Kent glasses on, I noticed. Um, he buys a used car and uh, drives south to die, basically. And um, while he's in the... He starts hallucinating. He's on the Scarlet Jungle on Krypton, um, which I think was mentioned in one of these other Alan Moore stories. Mm. But... um. Yeah, I remember. I think it, yeah, I think it was it was in uh 
uh, oh, man it, who has everything. Yeah, because he says he'll tell he's re, he'll read some kids some stories from the Scarlet Jungle or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are a few things repeated motifs, but anyway, so Swamp Thing finds him and um, dis- discovers that he's Superman and then tries to heal him. Superman's going berserk. He's burning up the forest with his heat vision. He breaks off Swamp Thing's arm, and uh, he regrows it. Um, <laughs> and um, somehow he tells him, calm down. Um, let go. And then he kind of fuses with him and then heals him and leaves. And Superman doesn't know how he healed. He thinks he just did it himself and flies away. And, Super- and Swamp Thing walks off back into the swamp. Yeah. I don't know. What'd you make of it? Um, hmm. didn't seem like there was an awful lot to it. I mean, it's kind of interesting, but, um... Yeah, I think it's kind of anticlimactic. Or... Uh-huh. I mean, how else did you expect it to end, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think they would have, it would have been harder to find a solution. It's almost like, just calm down, and they hold hands, and then Superman's cured, and that's kind of the end. Um... Yeah, I didn't. There's an issue of Swamp Thing where he fights Batman, hmm. um, and that's amazing. Um, it's an Alan Moore Swamp Thing issue, um, and I was kind of hoping he would channel something like that. I've read this one a couple of times too. It was an issue of DC Comics Presents, which was always Superman teaming up with some other DC superhero. Yeah, I I don't know. It's maybe it's kind of lacking those Alan Moore human moments. Hmm. Maybe that's the thing that's kind of missing from it. Yeah, I, and I think, like I said, I think there's not really any sort of tension to it or wondering what's going to happen. Cause, yeah, because you know, he's just... Because you, you know he's going to meet Swamp Thing because it's on the cover. Uh, right. And you know that he's sick and that it's plant-based. <laughs> and, you yeah. know, I can kind of fill in the rest from there. Right. I think the problem is it's not an imaginary story. Because in... <laughs> Because in the in whatever happened to the man tomorrow, it starts you know he's dead or something because it's ten years later. It's like there's no Superman. For, there hasn't been for ten years, mm. and um, it's kind of like you know in that one he's going to die and he's really afraid and he's sad about it. And he doesn't want to die, mm-hmm. but he knows it's coming because these people from the future have kind of hinted at it. Um, and this one it's like he's going to die, but he's going insane, so he kind of drives south and that's you know. That's it. And he's kind of mad. He's insane. So he can't really be sad about that he's going to die. He's just trying to get it over with. Um, so I think maybe that's kind of what what might be missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe an, yeah, another thing that's missing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. But you know, it, it's it's well drawn. Who drew this? Oh, yeah. It's Rick Bage. Beach, okay. Yeah, yeah, he did some. He drew some good oddball Superman stuff. Like he had a strange, rough style, which wasn't a good match, but made him a good match. I think mm. that's how I always felt about it. Yeah. Um, I think this is a like this is a good collection if you if you don't have weird, you know, ticks about it like I do. <laughs> I think any normal person would. This is a great little Superman collection of Alan Moore stories. Mm. Um, I don't think. I don't think any of the best of collections are quite best of. Um, there's something wrong with all of them. Yeah, well, and, and that's <laughs> inherently that, subjective too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but yeah, but every one of them, I feel like, oh, they should have included this one, and they shouldn't have included this one. Mm. Um, so there's no really clear. I don't know. There's no conclusion to this episode. There's no. We haven't come to any. <laughs> These are, Except, by some people's opinion, some of the best Superman stories. Right. Yes, and the Alan Moore collection is is worth getting if you. Yeah, you know, I think it's. I think anybody will enjoy it if they they're not a freak. Hmm. Um, yeah, but, and it's uh, available digitally. Yeah, the 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 yes, the, the, the larger book. I don't know. This, this came out thirty years ago. Is it? Well, I guess I did find it on Amazon. I think it might have been used. You can but, get the seventy fifth anniversary one, which has some crossover. Some of the stories. For our, uh, from this one or in the 75th anniversary one. And that one's pretty easy to get. I think, but I read a review of the 75th one as well that was um, about, it's, I think it was on Comics Alliance and they really hated it because they were all about Superman being sad. Um, 
And I think that's kind of true. A lot of the stories of Superman's really sad about whatever. Um, and there was a Lois Lane 75th anniversary as well. I haven't read that, uh, so I don't know how good that is. Hmm. But um, there, are, I would recommend instead of the best of, if people are interested in the 60s and 70s Superman stuff, they've got collections that they're called Superman in 60s, Superman in 70s, Superman in the 80s. That they're a solid bet. Lots of interesting stories in there. Hmm. I think okay. um, probably a better, better curated anthologies um, than some of these. This is Tim back in 2024. The greatest Superman stories ever told and Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow are, of course, published by DC. Kumar is the co-host of the podcast Comic Book Movie Oblivion about relatively obscure movies based on comics. If you're enjoying this podcast, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics and go to deconstructingcomics.com to connect to us on X Twitter Facebook, or YouTube. Via our site, you can also shop on Amazon to support the show and find links to subscribe to the podcast. You can comment on any episode there or drop us a line at mail at deconstructingcomics.com. Are you making a comic? Send us that and we'll do a critiquing comics episode about it. In the show notes, you'll find a link to our listener survey. Help us out by following the link and giving your opinions of this podcast. Later this year, a collection of Stan Mack's real-life funnies strips that ran in the Village Voice in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s will be released from Fantagraphics. The strip was promoted as being completely made up of overheard conversations in New York City. I'll be talking to Stan Mack on next week's show about choosing strips for the book and how his approach to real-life funnies changed over the years. In case you're not familiar with his work, and I certainly wasn't, Next week, I'll also be talking to our friend Joe Dater, a cartoonist for The New Yorker. Joe is a native of New York. He was very much aware of Mac's strip when it was coming out in The Voice, and he even took a class from Mac. So he'll be here next week to give us a lot of context for the strip and discuss its significance. So be sure to join us next week. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics.